Hello, everybody. Um, that's probably not that exciting talk as the other one. So that's from the user perspective when you use SDK. How many people use SDK? Successfully oh. or not? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask that. <laughs> so only half of that. And I'm talking only about SDK, not extensible SDK here. Um, like Philip mentioned, there are not a lot of stories of best practices, and probably some of it doesn't really fit best practices, but that was just my experience here. Um, shortly about me, my name is Vyacheslav Kirkov. I usually go with first name Slava because it's easier for everybody to pronounce. Um, I've been in software development for about 20 years already, different industries, and I work like software architect slash technical lead slash team lead for different companies, also as an employee and as a contractor. And as recently, I contributed the overlay fest classes to Open Embedded Core, and I try to maintain most of the things related to that uh, in Open Embedded Core and Meta Open Embedded. Those are my contact details. Um, lately, I've been also working, been active in the testing the changes of uh, recipe tool, which relate to Go recipes to the Golang language. So um, I want to share just a few stories related to SDK. But to start, so everybody knows that um, from the documentation how you build an SDK. Uh, you get your feedback environment. And you choose your image and choose the task populate SDK that will generate you SDK if you take copy. And then you execute the script and it gets installed on, on a user machine, on, on the developer machine. So that's pretty simple. Now, how to utilize that in practice in the sense that when you get into the project, um, you either get already an existing team structure or you try to teach the team how to use that approach and or to migrate to yoke based approach from the existing process. And that brings some challenges. Um, so one project I worked on, um, you have a soft PLC-like device, so a programmable logical controller device, uh, which consists of the base system based on pretty old Yocta release. That's why I specifically don't mention it here. <laughs> um, and the device has a set of system libraries and a set of application libraries. And there are two teams, one firmware team, one application team. So they don't care about the base system. They want basically only the, either the system libraries or application libraries. But each team doesn't care about the rest. So one team wants, OK, I work extensively on system libraries. Application team wants to work on application libraries. Um, for that, um, I had to do several things. So system libraries were providing uh, not only dynamic, but set of static libraries. And one thing you can also find in the manual that static libraries are not included by default in the SDK. You have to explicitly add them in the image. Uh, with the SDK image features at static dev packages. Um, like I said, it's pretty old, Yocht release. Maybe it got updated, so I'm not sure. Please correct me if I'm wrong here. But, um, like I mentioned, the team that deals with system libraries were not interested in the base system, uh, and they work, wanted to work only with those libraries. And the application team wanted to have those libraries in the SDK. So it turns out, at least uh, in my experience, for simplicity, I had to generate two SDKs, one for the system team and the other for the application team. So the system team SDK, um, I had to remove all the system libraries so that the system team gets just the base SDK. Maybe there's a better approach. That's what I came up with. And the application team gets the full SDK now with the system libraries. So I removed ex explicitly 
system libraries, but um, I added all the dependencies which are needed for system libraries. And that way, in my CI system, I generate two sets of SDK. That was one use case. Um, the other use case was um, a laser cutting device. That one has pretty up-to-date um, base system uh, based on Kernston branch. Um, the team was about three to five persons, so it's bigger. And they worked both on the, on the Yoxa base system and also on the main application. So it's kind of a, it was kind of a mix. Um, and how we use the SDK um, is for our CI, because the most changeable thing was, of course, our application. What we did, we did, had two, two kind of CIs. So we had one CI that built the whole base system and the SDK, which got uploaded to the internal Docker registry. And then the CI for the application could use that SDK to already build just application. So do not to build the whole image here. In order for that to work, and for simplicity, I also removed the application and just placed the dependencies in the SDK. Again, maybe that's a better approach, but that thing worked for me. And of course, the SDK could not only be used on the CI, but uh, by the developers on their machines. Um, another big project I worked on was um, a family of devices of N nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometers. So here we had kind of a platform which provided um, a lot of services like logging capabilities, system updates, etc. And that was based uh, on Yocto Kirkston. Um, and there was a dedicated team that supported all that and also based system libraries. And then there were different devices which used all that platform. So project team A, three to five person, which were also interested only in that. And same for another product. They used the base system, base libraries. They were interested in the SDK, but not in support of the base image. Um, a couple of things. Um, or oh, difficulties that we had is that that's a pretty complex device and there were some some hardware pieces um, we didn't have an open source drivers for so we had a hardware vendor for them for example for the PCI card that said okay we provide you the drivers but we need an SDK from you so what we did we provided them initial SDK and they provided us drivers. That, that way, we use those drivers to integrate them in the SDK which we used already. I'm not sure if there's a better way to achieve that when you work with the hardware vendor that doesn't give you the source code. And yeah, of course, in, the, in this image and the SDK, we already placed our um, closed source components with the header libraries and our internal Git repository and then fetch them. And they, then that's how they ended up here. Right. Um, another thing, that's pretty complicated and I faced it pretty recently. It has a specific example with the proto, protobuf and gRPC recipes in Meta OE. That's some excerpts which are relevant for this example. Um, so in order for the recipe to be built for the SDK, it has to derive from the native SDK uh, BB class. So you can do it like that. I guess you can also do it with inherit, but that's the usual way. Um, and there also should, should be a couple of dependencies. So in this particular case, gRPC recipe depends on the protobuf recipe. And what makes things more complicated is that both of them, protobuf and gRPC, 
they provide a generator which has to be run on the build host. So that's why this um, native dependency here and also native dependency here. Um, so this generator is called the compiler. It's a package in the compiler package. And here's the last dependency that in order to run that, that was an SDK. No, that's native. Yeah, so native needs the compiler to because the gRPC also provides this, this uh, generator, the compiler. So this works well for the target and the native build. Those are just excerpts from the recent master branch. But it failed recently for the SDK. Because when people use SDK and they use protobuf or gRPC, they of course expect um, the generation step to be done on a developer machine. And you need the native counterpart for that. You need that compiler generator. So up until recently, this brought up this error when you try to build native SDK gRPC. Uh, it tries to use the Proto C compiler, but it was not there. The reason for that um, actually comes, so for me it was a bit new. When you specify R depends, um, this deals on a package level. When you specify depends, um, it looks, it, it works on the recipe level. So I cannot specify here depends protobuf compiler because there's no such recipe, it's a package. Um, and how this works, um, there was a recent patch and a pretty heated discussion how to fix that. Um, so when you build the package, um, so that depends, <coughs> populates the sys root for you. And the sys root deals, I think it's specified in the staging class, if I'm not mistaken, I have to look it up. It's, it has a set of directories that goes into that sys root in order to build the recipe. And the compiler, is of course it's a binary and it's going to be in bi bin directory which was not included and that's why if you saw the previous slide that CMake complained that it cannot find a compiler which expects to be there although the dependency seems to be correctly so you have to extend the sys root in order to build the SDK correctly if you want a gRPC, I think the same thing applies to the MetaQt5 layer, which uses Qt gRPC wrapper on top of that. This fix has to be, has to be added. Uh, actually, this is already in master branch. Um, but what was confusing for a lot of people, and for me too, that this variable, so you build one thing, you build SDK, but somehow you specify sysroot dears and you're not sure which architecture is going to be. Is it going to be for the target or for the host? And that was confusing for a lot of people. That's why the, this discussion was a couple of months. Should we include this part? This was reverted by Ross, I think, or Cam. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I also raised the question, does it make sense to always include it? But uh, Richard Purdy said, yeah, that will increase the SDK in size and uh, the the build time of SDK will, will increase drastically. So I think the conclusion is to do that on the recipe basis. If you have kind of generator that needs to be included in the SDK. Yeah, I think that was it from my side. Thanks to my friend Bruno here for reviewing the slides and question and feedback. Thank you.